This is Luke Katsos, and I'm the president of EMCA, the East Mediterranean Business Culture Alliance. Tonight we have another program that relates to the uh, shipping industry. In this particular case, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the sacrifices of the merchant marines of uh, World War II, and also after the war, the uh, United States giving uh, the Greek uh, ship owners the blessed li uh, liberty ships. We have a fantastic panel uh, that we've assembled today. We're doing this event as, uh, as um, MCA likes, MCA is an alliance. They like to do events with, uh, with other people. Uh, and when it works uh, to what uh, our mission is, and if there's any way we can help other organizations, we do that also. So this evening, we're uh, also doing this in association with uh, AHEPA. And in this particular case, the AHEPA National Cultural Commission. I am also the vice chairman of the AHEPA National Cultural Commission. And uh, it's my pleasure to bring this event uh, tonight uh, to the audience. Uh, some AHEPA members, but certainly also the EMCO audience, the East Mediterranean Business Cultural Alliance uh, audience. This is uh, a part one of uh, two events that we're having. Uh, one is tonight where we're going to talk about uh, the uh, Merchant Marines and World War II and their sacrifices and the devastation of the Hellenic shipping fleet. And then in a couple of weeks on February the 8th, where EMCA is having a, an event in Greece itself in the port of Pirea. We're doing it aboard the uh, Liberty ship, the Liberty Alas. And it's also the 10th anniversary when the uh, Liberty ship uh, Huddle was transported from Virginia to the port of Piraeus. So it's a 10th year anniversary. We're going to discuss that. We're going to discuss, obviously, uh, the issue of, uh, of uh, the monument that we have uh, also been talking about at EMCA, the thing that we've been um, exposing people to for the last couple of years or so. The first time I think we brought up the issue was when uh, EMCA had uh, the Prime Minister of Greece, uh, Tsipras, who was at one of, a, one of our events, and we mentioned the fact that we thought it was appropriate to have a monument uh, in the United States, similar to the monument that they have right now, the Alas Liberty in Greece, but a monument in the United States, um, hopefully in, in Lower Manhattan, maybe in Battery Park, if uh, we have to obviously talk to the appropriate officials to see if we can do that. But we want a monument that basically honors and discusses the sacrifices of the merchant marines, the loss and devastation of the Hellenic fleet during World War II, and then a thank you to the United States for selling uh, the Liberty ships to the uh, Greek ship owners. Many people don't realize this, but uh, the Greek uh, merchant marines actually, when the war broke out, many of them were based in the United States. A lot of the shipping companies were based in Lower Manhattan, for example, which is why Battery Park becomes uh, important to us for this monument. The other reason is, in the past, uh, on the west, uh, west of Broadway, you had uh, an area where there was a lot of uh, a large Hellenic population. And then the only, the only religious institution that was destroyed in Lower Manhattan was St. Nicholas. And St. Nicholas was, was the patron saint of the seafarers. And a lot of the people who were the merchant marines in the past, in fact, contributed to establishing St. To establishing Nicholas. So for all those reasons, uh, we're we're uh, promoting promoting uh, the monument, and when we're in Greece on the uh, on February 8th for the 10th anniversary of the of the Liberty ship that uh, when it left Virginia and went to uh, the port of Piraeus, in the 10th year anniversary, we also want to discuss the issue of the monument and bring it also to the Hellenic population. We're going to have a great panel there. I'm going to moderate that panel as I'm moderating this panel tonight. In that particular panel, we'll also have the American ambassador uh, uh, to the Hellenic Republic, who is Pyatt. We're going to have the vice admiral of the uh, Hellenic fleet. We're going to have one of the major ship owners uh, who himself had, uh, or his family had purchased Liberty ships after the war. That's Polemus. And uh, we have Pitas, another major ship owner. And we also have uh, Senator, Rhode Island Senator uh, Raptakis, State Senator Raptakis, who is very instrumental in working with the American government to get the, the SS Huddle that became the, uh, the Liberty ship or the Alas Liberty in the Port of Piraeus. Thank you. I hope you enjoy uh, this evening's uh, event. Leonidas Raptakis, State Senator from uh, Rhode Island. This was a very, very important evening tonight to, again, the history of the Alas Liberty 
tying it in with Greek shipping. It shows the importance also of the United States and Greece, the, the communication and the uh, relationship. Good evening, my name is Alexander Bilinas, and today I'm going to be talking about Greek merchant mariners, the unsung heroes of World War II. There's so much we don't know about the sacrifices made by so many brave Greek mariners who risk their lives on the deadly run across the Atlantic as well as in the Mediterranean. I think it's high time that we take an active interest in this and we learn as much as possible and we share stories that we've inherited from our forefathers who did this very, very important work for the war effort. My name is Jim Tampakis. I am with a company called Marine Spares International. I was the project manager with the uh, prepping of the Liberty ship, which was tied up uh, in the James River for over 30 years and was uh, pretty much abandoned and was uh, destined for a scrapyard. And we took the ship and we prepped it and did whatever we needed to do with it so we can get a safe voyage across the Atlantic and uh, where today I'm proudly, uh, I honor the vessel and all the seamen of the uh, Greek Hellenic Maritime. Uh, and I'm a regular on board the vessel on every year and the ship looks brand new. And when we had the U.S. Maritime Administrator there a couple of years ago, he loved the ship and he was asking me if, we, if he can get it back to the United States. Mm -hmm. And I laughed nicely. Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming this evening. My name is uh, Luke Katsos. I'm the uh, president of AMCA. And uh, tonight, uh, this particular event, we're going to do in association with uh, AHEPA's Hellenic Cultural Commission and also Delphi uh, Chapter 25. This will be the third uh, Seraphim Canutus lecture that we're going to be doing. And we've done all three, actually. Uh, MK has done all three in association with, uh, with the HEPA. Uh, let me just briefly discuss uh, the series, the Seraphim uh, Canutus series that we started uh, last year. Uh, Seraphim Canutus um, was, the, uh, was regarded as the first uh, historian of the Hellenes in the Western Hemisphere. He was an extremely famous person in the early 19th century. He was a diplomat, he was an attorney. Uh, he wrote one of the most uh, famous uh, collection of materials that related to uh, early Hellenic American life. He published what was called the uh, Canutus uh, Greek American Business Guide where he uh, listed every business uh, that was in existence in the United States, state by state, city by city, and also uh, businesses in Canada. He started the series in about uh, 1908, uh, ended up selling, uh, selling the series uh, later about 1914 or so. Canutis, uh, anyone who reads anything about Hellenic, uh, early Hellenic American history and uh, goes to the bibliography, they will always see uh, Canutis uh, listed. We named uh, the series, uh, the Canutis, Seraphim Canutis uh, Lecture Series, because he was also um, Delphi Chapter 25's uh, president. Uh, he did appear at the conventions uh, of AHEPA, and uh, I just happened to be the president of Delphi 25, so it was, uh, it was interesting to me. Um, and again, when, when it was first brought up that he was the president, and uh, we got the idea, let's set up a series uh, in his name. The first event that we had had to do with the Hellenic Revolution. Uh, the second one had to do with the Istanbul Program, uh, which took place on September 6th and 7th of 1955. And this will be the third, uh, the third lecture. Originally, well, we started last, uh, about two years ago, to have um, what we called uh, shipping uh, panel discussions, Hellenic shipping panel discussions. And uh, among the topics that we discussed was uh, the issue of the uh, contribution of the Hellenic Merchant Marines and, the, and their sacrifices. Um, one event that we had, which was a historical event, it had to do with uh, archives. 
where we discussed the Hellenic American archives, uh, connecting back with the archives of Greece. We had, we had three lecturers at the time. We had Professor Alexiou, who spoke about the archives that he was putting together at Queens College. Uh, we had Professor Kitroff, who spoke about uh, various archives uh, around the United States. And we had uh, George uh, Tsellis, who's with us tonight, uh, who's the uh, chief archivist of Ellis Island, and he discussed the, uh, the Ellis Island uh, archives. Uh, that evening, we also had as a guest uh, the Prime Minister of Greece, uh, Tsipras. Uh, he was at the event. And it was at that event uh, that uh, we brought up, that I brought up, that we have to um, establish, we have to establish a monument uh, in Lower Manhattan that related to the story of the Hellenic Merchant Marine uh, uh, fleet, the lost mariners, there's about 2,500 of them that, were, that died in the, in the sea. And also, after the war, uh, we had the Blessed Liberty ships that were given or sold to uh, Hellenic ship owners. And that became the basis of the modern, of the modern Hellenic fleet uh, that now is the largest in the world. And uh, it was appropriate uh, in our minds to have a monument because sometimes things happen in history and we don't record them, we don't acknowledge them, and people just forget about some of the things that took place. Part of what the motivation was for the monument had to do with this concept of, of the Hellenic people, the Hellenic merchant marines, and the United States, and the friendship that those two nations had historically. Obviously, many of us sometimes, uh, every year, we celebrate October 28th, Ochi Day, and we discuss the sacrifices that took place, how that particular day affected, affected what took place in Europe, how that particular day raised the spirits of everyone, that that, that particular little country, after nation after nation was falling to fascist forces, stopped for the first time in history the, the, the uh, all these massive troops that were invading nation after nation, 13 countries before the 14th country, which, which uh, was Greece later with the film. That event was very important in Hellenic American history because it, trans it really changed the way people viewed uh, Hellenic Americans here in the United States. Before that, to a certain degree, we were the other. Even though there were tremendous strides made by a HEPA in particular, and that's why we're doing the event also with a HEPA, that event itself was uh, was a monumental event in the, in the, in the history of, uh, of the world, actually. And we don't emphasize it enough as not a Hellenic holiday, a Hellenic day, but a, an international day, a European day. Along with that, along with that, what many people don't know is what was taking place uh, in the sea. What many people don't know is even before Orchid Day, ships were destroyed. What people don't know is that Hellenic ships were transporting supplies and weapons in the Eastern Mediterranean. What people don't know is those ships that were supplying the British, who were in the Eastern Mediterranean, in many cases were Hellenic ships. So we thought it was very important. And, and for the last, uh, you know, after that event that we talked about, we, uh, we, also, we also decided to have uh, shipping uh, uh, panel discussions. And those shipping panel discussions related to really what's happening in the shipping industry right now. We, have a, we had a list of uh, panelists that were you know, high up in the industry, and we all, always had a moderator that, that knew about that industry and was basically discussing it, and we would always discuss uh, during, that, uh, during that thing, the concept of the monument. So this uh, particular event, uh, which we're calling the International Contribution and Sacrifice of the Hellenic Merchant Marine Shipping Fleet during World War II, and the blessed Liberty ships relates relates to the concept not so much of the uh, of the shipping panel discussion, but relates to the history of the of the whole issue that we're talking about in terms of the concept of wanting to erect a monument in Lower Manhattan. We are going to have the uh, the shipping uh, the shipping uh, conference, but we're going to do it. Emka is going to do the conference in Greece. We're going to do it in the port of Pira. Uh, we're doing it on February 8th, and it's really the second part, the second part of what we're going to be discussing tonight. At that particular event, uh, this particular year, it's the, it's the 10th anniversary, 
the 10th anniversary of when the, uh, the SS Huddle, a Liberty ship, one of only three, one of only three out of 2,700 that were built during World War II, was transported from Virginia to the port of Piraeus. It happened, it happened in January, actually, when it landed in, uh, in Piraeus. So we're going to have an event to celebrate the 10th anniversary of that. We're going to have an event that discusses, uh, obviously, what's happening in, uh, in the Hellenic shipping. And we are, are going to discuss the monument, and in particular, we're going to discuss the concept of Hellenic and American friendship over those years and relating to this particular, this particular topic. We are going to have, I'm going to moderate the panel. We're going to have the American ambassador of uh, the Hellenic Republic, which is Payet. We're going to have the vice admiral of the uh, Hellenic Navy, which is Pavlopoulos. We're going to have various uh, ship owners, including uh, Paul Lemus, including Pitas, uh, who will be on the panel. And uh, we are going to have also on the panel one of our speakers later today, um, Senator Artakis, State Senator Artakis from Rhode Island. So I'm going to speak a little bit longer in the beginning because I'm going to make my history, uh, I'm going to be the first speaker, but I'm going to make my history of the, of the uh, Hellenic, uh, modern Hellenic uh, shipping fleet very short. Uh, I will say that about the event, just so we, we understand, we have with us uh, over here are some uh, very important people that uh, I'll introduce in a second. We are doing it in association with the, with the HEPA's uh, Hellenic Cultural Commission. And uh, so we, we have uh, Joseph Keane, who's the chairman of the HEPA you know, Hellenic uh, uh, Cultural Commission. And we also have, uh, very importantly, we have uh, the Supreme Vice President of HEPA, which is the largest Hellenic, uh, Hellenic American organization founded in 1922, uh, Jimmy Kokotas. So I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Jimmy Kokotas first, uh, who is uh, HEPA's Supreme uh, Vice President, to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Lou. It is an honor to be here with you this evening. I commend what's going on. Putting events like this together, this is the second lecture that I've been fortunate enough to attend. Uh, Joe Keane, our chairman of the Hellenic Cultural Commission, who's been doing it for, I don't know, 40, 50 years, Joe? No, Something like that? Uh, a long time. And the president of his chapter, the New Rochelle chapter, has done a wonderful job. He was just honored a couple of months ago for his many years of service to this organization. I don't think we could have found somebody with more zeal for history and the truth than Lou Katzos. And he will always uh, keep us honest and make sure that nothing gets faltered along the way in the textbooks or from mouth to mouth. It fits into what a HEPA stands for in preserving and promoting the Greek values. And this history that we'll hear here tonight and the other history that they've worked to present in these lectures is stuff that if it's not preserved and if people aren't doing the research now and keeping it alive and documenting it, it will be lost in 10 or 20 years. And that's the shame of it. So I just thank everybody. I thank you, Lou. I thank Delphi Chapter and everybody who's here. Joe, thank you for your years of service and commitment. Um, I hope that this will continue. I hope it will gather steam. I hope more people will become interested because it really is uh, a learning experience. And to know how much history we've already probably lost, it basically says that history teaches you nothing. It just punishes you for not learning its lessons. So there's a lot of lessons to be learned in the history, if we want to. And if we don't want to learn those lessons, so be it. Somewhere down the road, we'll learn, we'll learn the hard way through the lesson. So thank you very much. The next person I'm going to introduce is someone that, uh, that should be emulated by everyone, quite frankly. He has uh, held together a very important uh, commission within the uh, HEPA family, uh, the Hellenic Cultural Commission. Uh, he is the chairman, and he's done a marvelous job, a fantastic job over the years uh, by bringing out certain things, historical things that are very important. The other thing that we had talked about, and that's why also this particular event, uh, even though it's an MCO event in association, this is the first event, I believe, Joe, that is basically outside, outside of the HEPA family with, with another organization. And we had chatted, we had chatted about uh, expanding this. So I hope that this is the first uh, part of the expansion, that we actually take this uh, nationally to discuss different issues of importance to the 
to a particular district. Every district, obviously, has its uh, universities. Every district has its professors. Every particular community has its interests. And I think that uh, with your leadership and, and uh, the, the thought process of expansion, I think that the Hellenic Cultural Commission will be an extremely important part of, of uh, HEPA. Uh, I am pleased and honored to introduce the chairman of HEPA, the Hellenic Cultural Commission, Joseph C. Thank you, Lou, for the kind words and the invitation, and thank you, Jimmy, for the kind words as well. You're probably looking at me and saying, he doesn't look Greek. He doesn't have a Greek name. What's he doing as chairman of the Hellenic Cultural Commission? And for that, I have to thank, I did the next best thing. I married Greek. And my sweetheart Demetra is here. So, being a... She's in education, so being in education, one of the things they do is they write. And so she wrote when we were first married, and I had the benefit of reading those. And uh, I did some ending on them at her request. And guess what they were about? If she's Greek, that she's writing about Hellenism. So I was hooked, and I became a Philhellene. And believe it or not, Hellenism is contagious. But we have to be missionaries and get the word out. There's so much there. It's not only the contribution of the golden age of Greece, it's the values that are Hellenism. You see it when you take your oath as becoming a heaven, and I'll talk about that a little later. But give me a little background on the Hellenic Cultural Commission. It's a subcommittee of the Educational Foundation and the one who gets credit for founding it is Jim Schofield. Jim is a past Supreme President. He said, this is a golden opportunity where we bring thousands of Greeks together once a year at a Supreme Convention. It's a golden opportunity to educate them on their values and their history and what's important, what they've done for the world, and most important for Western civilization. So we have Jim give credit for founding it. Uh, but our goal is to provide content. And Lewis is absolutely right. This is the best example of what you're doing with this lecture series. Our intent is to make speakers, books, films, content available so that chapters in district can get the word out on Hellenism. Not everybody goes to the Supreme Conventions. So we want to make that opportunity available. So this is a perfect, and Lewis has done a superb job you know, in this lecture series, and also he recently joined the commission. He's probably our most active and vocal and financial supporter of the committee. The other one I'd like to talk about is the gentleman joined our committee, Dr. Bill Collis. He was from Lexington, Kentucky. And what he did is he went down and he, he highlighted the Hellenic ideals so if you, if you will, bear with me, I'd like to read those to you because they're really what we're talking about. The importance and worth of the individual, the concept of liberty with freedom for all, a commitment of service to our community and fellow man, an appreciation for our gifts for our creator, from our creator, and, a, and caring and loyal and lovingly the value of seeking the truth and being guided by it, the principle of democracy allowing all citizens to govern, awareness of perfect duty leading us to higher aspiration, valuing the supremacy of reason and utilizing ethics as a concept, the importance of continually learning and growing. Those are values of Hellenism. He communicated those in Lexington, Kentucky, and he formed a committee who would nominate a candidate each year that best reflected those values. So they have uh, opera singers, they have artists, they have educators, they have scholars, that once a year they give them a lunch and recognize them for their contribution. So Lexington, Kentucky is all Phil Hellenes. And that's one man's achievement because he got the word out. So that's what we should all be doing relative to Hellenism. 
Now let me talk about some of the things we've done on a national level, just to give you an idea. Because what Lewis is doing here in his lecture series is outstanding. And as a matter of fact, he was instrumental in the last one that we did. The, it was a seminar which Lewis is very familiar with because he was the moderator of the seminar. The topic was Turkey's irredentism of the Eastern Mediterranean. And on the panel, we had an ambassador and two professors. Ambassador Gaddis, Professor Kittroff, Professor Templar, and Lewis was our moderator. It was a terrific panel. It was very well received. It must have had 300 that happens there. And it talked about a very important topic to all Greeks and Philhellenes. So that's the kind of exhibit we did. That was one of our exhibits and panels that was very well received. Other times we have scholars come and present. One of them was Andre Gerolomatos. He is a Hellenic professor at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. He came in and he spoke to, at the time, uh, Turkey was being considered in the European Union. He was very knowledgeable about Israel, Iran, Turkey, and the European Union. And he spoke on the topic and he told us the importance of what was going to happen if Turkey wasn't admitted, what, what was going to happen. He was almost prophetic in what he was talking about. The other thing that he talked about is he's written a book on the international civil war, which I would commend to you if you haven't read it. It talks about the Greece, the pivotal role that Greece played at the end of World War II, the politics that were involved, the American foreign policy that Greece influenced, and there was a cru crucial involved in the starting point of the Civil War. And he, what he did, it's very tough to rule all that together, because there were three, really, three civil wars. But he identified the people who were involved. You might remember the date, November 29, 1922, the execution of the six. That was a time when the six who were accused were not defended, the foreign powers, France, Germany, England did not intervene and they were executed. All the players that were involved in that, he traces them through all three civil wars and it in part explains the politics that has happened in Greece since that time in the 20th century. So it's a very instrumental, influential book. Another event we did was the patriarch Bartholomew and Pope Francis visited the Holy Land in May 25th, 2014. The Archdiocese photographed all three days. The Cultural Commission commissioned a 30-minute tape of that visit with the highlights. And it was a tremendous, it was a 50-year reenactment of what the Patriarch and Paul VI and Athenagoras and Paul VI did 50 years earlier. And it was very moving if you looked at the churches. There are differences, but when you see the two leaders of the church, the love they had for each other, and their remarks that they had, we commissioned a 30-minute speech. We programmed it, uh, set it up at the convention. We made it available for chapters and districts. And it was very informative on the future of the, the two religions. <coughs> if you came away from it, you almost had the expectation that churches were going to get united for the love that the two leaders had for each other. The final one I want to talk about is really instrumental for tonight's, sort of sets the stage for tonight. We talked about it just earlier, it was just mentioned. It's a book, The First Victory by George Bleetus. It starts off with OB Day, but it talks about stopping Mussolini for five and a half months, which set the stage. That was the first victory that the Allies experienced in World War II. And it was so instrumental that the leaders who talked about it, Churchill said, we used to call people who fought heroes. Now we call them Greeks. That was just one of the tributes. Probably the greatest tribute was paid by Stalin. And what he said is you fought without weapons and you won. 
We owe you gratitude because you bought time. As Russians and as fellow humans, we thank you. And the bottom line is if you speculate on what would have happened if Greece didn't say, oh, we. That five and a half months was crucial to destroying Barbarossa, which was the invasion of Russia. The whole situation would have changed. So the Greek contribution was not only what they did with Mussolini, but when you read the book, it's the World War II seen through the prism of Greece. And what it tells you is that Greece suffered as a country more losses, more casualties, and longer than any other country involved in the war. And it was a tremendous contribution. So with that introduction to tonight's Marines. Thank you, Rose. The oldest, the oldest Hellenic profession. What is the oldest Hellenic profession? Shipping. Okay, it's it's shipping. It's shipping. When you think about uh, the Hellenic people, you you think about shipping. It started obviously thousands of years ago. It started in the Bronze Age. Uh, the the Noans that were into shipping. The Mycenaeans were into shipping. Uh, when they were talking about the. When the Egyptians were talking about the people of the sea, <laughs> what do you think they were, they were basically talking about, all these invaders uh, in the sea? They, they were uh, into shipping. Uh, it has to do, obviously, a lot with the geography of the Hellenic nation, uh, the fact that uh, it just has a tremendous, tremendous uh, seacoast area, the fact that it has a lot of islands, which allow people to go from island to island to visit other areas. It has to do with an entrepreneurial spirit of people basically trading various products from one area to the other, picking up something from one location, picking up uh, something from another, selling wine, selling olive oil, and all the rest of that. I mean, we, we, we think we have commerce, but in reality, that commerce was taking place thousands of years ago. Uh, you had uh, commerce, in fact, taking place even with England in, into, the, uh, into the archaic ages. Uh, iron ore and all the rest of that was being transported. Copper was taken from, uh, for example, from Cyprus and where, where, it, where it gets its name. So shipping is not something that, uh, that is new, that is not new to the, uh, to the Hellenic people. And when we talk about Hellenism in general, Okay, just understand the Hellenism that we're talking about at, at, at this particular stage and what uh, Brother Joe was talking about a second ago. The Hellenism that we're talking about is not about being Greek. It, it really is not. It's, it's the Hellenism within all of us in terms of our society, whether it's European society or American society. So when we talk about Hellenism, that's really the Hellenism uh, that, that we're discussing. Certainly, uh, even when the Romans, when the Romans took over, uh, you know, many people don't talk about it, but a lot, of the, a lot of the ships that were going back and forth and bringing the products into the Roman Empire from Egypt, grain from Egypt and all the rest of that, were Hellenic ships. After that, into the, uh, into the Byzantine period and the whole Eastern Mediterranean, all that trade was with, with again, Hellenic ships into the Black Sea and into, uh, into other areas. The Ottoman period, the Ottoman period, <laughs> most of the ships were Hellenic ships. When we talk about Venice, okay, Venice fighting, you know, fighting the Ottoman Empire and all the rest of that, who is who is manning uh, the Venetian ships? You know, think about that. It's uh, it's very important. So during the Ottoman period, certainly there was a lot of trade, and also during the Ottoman period, uh, a lot of the trade that was taking place with the West uh, was on Hellenic ships, and that's also how they, they started to learn what was happening in the West at, at that particular time. During the uh, later, and even during the, uh, again, the Ottoman period, because the Ottoman Empire didn't fall really until the 1920s, but uh, during the, uh, please, please lower the phones, uh, during the, uh, the Napoleon Wars, for example, where you had uh, England and France fighting with each other, who was supplying the different armies? Okay, who were the people that were making tremendous fortunes that later on uh, they used actually those fortunes and those ships to, uh, to fight in the revolution? So it was always the case. Uh, uh, there were obviously um, a lot of families, a lot of famous families, uh, a lot of wealthy people. 
At a point in time, obviously the Fennel riots, or the, the Hellenes from uh, Fanar became uh, very wealthy and were you know, very into shipping and trading, uh, not only within the, uh, within the uh, empire, the Ottoman Empire, but also you know, into, into Russia and, uh, and all the rest of that. And then even after the revolution, and, and the mariners played an extremely important role in the revolution, that we're not going to go into again because we have other speakers to talk to tonight. Even, even then, with that wealth, uh, they took that wealth, but they, they also didn't keep it to themselves. They created some of the greatest libraries. You know, the library, the Hellenic library was founded by them. A lot of the schools were founded by, by the ship owners. And even after, even after the, uh, you know, the revolution and, uh, and you had uh, the creation, the modern creation of the Hellenic state. Those families were international families by that time. You have families, for example, like the Raleigh's, who had, who had offices in Marseille, they had offices in London, they had offices in, in France, they had offices in India, they had offices in the United States. We, 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 we think about, we think about um, our, uh, some of our ancestors, early Hellenic Americans, and we think about the immigrants who came from the different villages and towns. But the first people, the first Hellenes that came into the, United, into the United States were merchants, very wealthy merchants. And they had established offices in New York. They had established offices in, uh, in, um, in New Orleans and in Charleston, uh, Carolina. They controlled the cotton trade of the world, okay, between their ships that were buying at that time before the, uh, before the Civil War. They were buying, uh, you know, uh, cotton uh, from the south. They were buying cotton from Alexandria. They literally controlled, controlled the cotton trade. And, and if you look at uh, the annals of the, the American uh, uh, Cotton Exchange, for example, you'll see on the board most of the names are, are Hellenic, uh, Hellenic names. I'm going to, I'm going to just uh, basically state that uh, the Hellenic shipping fleet did not become what we know it is today, just all of a sudden after World War II. What I'm trying to get across is it, it was always, always an important element of economic, uh, international economic uh, endeavors. And uh, even before, even before World War II, the Hellenic fleet was getting huge. They were getting actually very large. But obviously the war took place. Obviously some of the ships were flying British flags and all the rest of that. We talked earlier when I made the introduction, the fact that, that we were supplying the allies with, with our ships. And when the war broke out, when the war broke out, some of the ships that were obviously um, you know, within the, the British realm, they stayed there and they, they were during the war, which will be described by uh, by our next speaker, Alexander, where he's going to talk about the uh, unsung heroes. But uh, besides that, the other ships actually came into, into the United States. And uh, for example, many mer merchant marines uh, landed in the United States and actually joined the American armed forces to fight, to fight in, in World War II uh, during that period. A lot of the, uh, many people don't know this also, a lot of the shipping companies, they were based in New York, in lower Manhattan some of the largest, largest shipping companies. And they still, some still have smaller offices, but they were there. When the, when the war broke out, uh, we talk about the Liberty ships and it becomes very important. Uh, when the war broke out, uh, some of those ship owners were there, they had no ships, they were devastated, etc. The United States actually, actually gave those uh, ship owners uh, 15 Liberty ships during the war. We talk about after the war, but even during the war, they gave them 15 uh, Liberty ships and they used it again for America to transport materials back and forth uh, for the war effort. Out of the 15 ships, there was only one ship lost. Okay, one ship lost. And that ship was the Eleftheria, Liberty. Okay, the only ship that was lost was Liberty. And uh, it was, uh, it was uh, in, in naval um, architecture, you know, those ships were actually quite unique because they were welding, they were welding the ships. And many, many people felt that well, you know, it wasn't the same thing as putting uh, rivets or what have you, and they felt that those ships wouldn't last. But those ships absolutely lasted. Uh, the ship owners uh, 
who uh, were using those, those ships during the war, they loved them. And when the war was over, and again as a gratitude thing, and again to be back, because they had no money. They, they lost their ships, they had no money. They spoke to the Hellenic government. The Hellenic government decided to, to back end or to support them buying the ships. The United States sold the ships to them at a, at a small percentage, the rest, the rest to be borrowed at a very low interest, rates, or in, uh, interest rate. And they started with about, uh, and again, they'll tell the story better than I do, they started with about uh, 100, 100 ships and, and also the 15 ships that they had. I think it was about 107 actually. Uh, post-war, including with the uh, with the 15 that I mentioned uh, earlier, and uh, that became the uh, the modern Hellenic fleet that expanded, the largest in the world by far, and uh, everything everything that you touch, everything that you touch, in many cases came from a Hellenic ship, okay? Because 16 percent of all the world trade, all the world trade. Is on is on Hellenic ships. So uh, one of the things that uh, where I got the original idea, but I'm not going to go into it because again I'm, I'm speaking too long. I'm supposed to be too uh, be brief. But someone did write uh, Fustanas actually. He was going to be one of the speakers in um, in Athens uh, on uh, on February the eighth, but but he, he got uh, didn't work out exactly with his schedule. But that was a, I read his work where I got the idea, because at the time that, I, that I, I got the concept of what we're talking about tonight was when I was with the uh, Hellenic American Chamber of Commerce. I was actually the executive vice president. And uh, I was speaking at one of the, uh, I was going to be speaking at one of the halls that they were having. And I just wanted to find out a little bit about the history of the Hellenic American Chamber of Commerce. And then going into the history of the chamber, uh, the chamber was actually started uh, as a recommendation by the, the U.S. Department of State to the ship owners, because the Hellenic American Ch Chamber of Commerce is basically the ship owners started it and expanded it, and the um, the uh, State Department basically said to them, "Hey, you guys uh, who have these, these the shipping companies, etc., the delivery ships, whatever, form a former Chamber of Commerce." So they formed it in, a, in a, right after the war, post-war. With that, I'm going to be, and I wasn't that brief, unfortunately. I'm going to introduce uh, a very good friend. Uh, you know, he's a, he's a writer. He's written uh, some fantastic books. Uh, he's uh, he obviously writes for various magazines. Uh, he's also he's also teaching right now. He's he's a lawyer. I've had him on my radio program a few times, and I said to myself, when I introduce a concept of, of the monument, we have to get publicity and all the rest of that type of stuff. And since Alexander is a writer. Alexander is going to write the book relating to his grandfather and his experience. With that, I introduce Alexander Bullitz. Uh Well, uh, Lou has now uh, thrown down the gauntlet, so accepted. Okay, we have witnesses here, and I will also draw on the expertise of everyone in this room in global Hellenism and our continuing friendship, which has been um, which has been a, a a source of great banter. We've got a lot of great ideas, so absolutely, let's uh, let's move on from that. Uh, not surprisingly, some of my stunt thunder has been stolen uh, in some of the uh, subject matter for today, but I think there's going to still be enough that this is going to be uh, a personal and moving discussion because we're talking a lot of numbers here a lot of statistics, and so often when we talk about unsung, unknown heroes, and, and Brother Kokotas was, uh, I just became an Ahepan yesterday, and my son just became a member of the Sons of Pericles, so I'm invoking the terminology of the order. Uh, uh, as, as Brother Kokotas said, there's no question that um, it is to a degree the way of Greeks not to uh, necessarily broadcast what they've done in the service of Greeks, but I think those of us who come after have the responsibility to give honor where it's due. And I'm going to keep bringing up that comment, honor is due. Because what we have today was very much built on that bridge of steel 
that went across the Atlantic and sometimes didn't get across the Atlantic. And when it didn't get across the Atlantic, there were widows and there were orphans, right? And many of us have these stories in our families. I'm also going to call on all of you to help me with your stories. Because for this to really be valuable, it has got to be stories that speak to all of us. Because so many Greeks are products of the Merchant Marine. All right, let's go to the presentation. I'm now at Clemson University. I'm an instructor there, and I'm also a scholarship student in the uh, history department. I'm getting my master's in history. Uh, my wife calls it my midlife crisis. I think it's probably a bit better than some fancy car. And I'm actually te teaching science and technology, and we're moving towards self-driving cars, so <laughs> that's not even going to be relevant. But uh, like many of you here, and certainly my good friend Lou, history has always been passion and I'm at a stage in my life where I have the support of my family to continue that and my history is our history. Most of what I have written about and studied about concerns our people or the larger Byzantine people because my wife is Serbian. I love Serbia very much and um, I feel that there's a lot of history there that needs to be we need to build awareness, uh, as Brother Keene said. The awareness building is key. This particular ship, it's a faded photograph from the Bundesarchiv in Stuttgart. The name of the uh, ship is the Halcyon. That's going to become relevant later on in the discussion. George, anything familiar to you there? Yeah. I'm a Hydriot. I'm from Idra, and we are a very proud people. And uh, not for nothing, I think that uh, we do need to talk about the modern Greek merchant fleet uh, starting at Hydra. Lou mentioned the activities of these uh, ship owners and brave shippers that were running the British blockade of Marseille. <coughs> well, most of those ships were from Hydra. They were also from our sister island, Spetses, and also from Psara. All of you are familiar with all three of these islands. This is, uh, on top, is the Hydriot Brig, the Aris, built in 1807 in Venice. A merchant ship, but like all good Greek merchant ships, could be converted for military use. Below is Andoni Sepinomo, a Hydriot sea captain, who helped induce the revolution into Idra. Uh, my late father, this was his favorite guy because uh, he wasn't a big ship owner. He was a, uh, I guess you'd call it part of the uh, professional middle class of Hydra. And he made sure that his island did the right thing. And of course, the island paid for it in losing most of their ships and their treasure, but what they got was Greece and glory. And it's a pretty good trade. Greek shipping has always been a key component of the Greek economy. Lou did a very good job of giving you a perspective of just how long shipping has been part of the Greek economy. And indeed, it is a function in large part of geography, but also in the skill, bravery, and agility of the Greek sailor. In this more modern era, skilled, agile, family-owned businesses were and are the backbone of the fleet. Greek shipping in its current form, as I said, is a late Ottoman phenomenon. And even though most of the Greek ships by the end of the War of Independence were at the bottom of the ocean, they recovered rapidly. So in 1939, Greece had the ninth largest merchant fleet in the world. And again, as Lou was saying, we kept moving up in the ranks. Then what happened? Well, we all know about the bravery of the Greek soldiers in the mountains of Epiros in Albania and the Greek nation that set Orchi. In reality, the Orchi began as soon as Britain declared war on Germany. 
because Greek ships were going down and Greek sailors were losing their lives from September 1939. Eight ships went down September 1939. In 1940, before Greece was at war with either Germany or Italy, about 50 Greek ships went down. Hmm. And in 1941, when Greece and Germany <coughs> did go to war, you had about half of the total losses of the Greek shipping had already occurred. It, Greek ships were going down in the Mediterranean. They were going down in the English Channel. They were being uh, attacked by bombers, by surface raiders, and of course by the deadly U-boats and by Italian U-boats because the one area that the Italians were more successful at was at sea. And they were picking off Greek ships before war was declared. Anyone familiar with the uh, destroyer Eli? Yeah. Right? Of course, uh, it, was, it was rhetorical. August 15th, 1940, Tinos Harbor. So Greek ships were going down and Greeks were dying before the heroic Orchi. Honor is due. Why are we not talking about that? Why are we not talking about the key role that the Greek shipping fleet play, uh, played in keeping that supply bridge open? Because Britain would have starved to death Interesting. without that lifeline. And we're going to go into some statistics later to show just how crucial the Greek role was. From this book, which uh, my family called the Bible over about a month of me getting all the information out. This, uh, Lou let me borrow this book. I created this, I also used other sources, but each of those crosses represents a Greek ship that went down. Now obviously you see the mass is in this killing zone of the North Atlantic, but you've also got the Mediterranean and you've got the random U-boat or Japanese sub victim in the Pacific, well, I don't have the Pacific, but in the Indian Ocean as well. All these ships. If you go to alexdelinas.com and you go to my map, story map of Greek merchant mariners in World War II, you can click on each of these and find out the name of the ship, the tonnage, the date it went down, and the number of fatalities. My goal, no, our goal is to put to those stats stories, okay? So you're not getting out of here just with the information. I'm asking for your help. <coughs> and there is a, on my uh, website, you can provide your story. You can provide your pictures. So this is the guy. Lou mentioned. This is Alexandros Villinis, born in a village above the uh, Laconian town of Neapolis, married to a hydriot, right? Sea captain's daughter, a sponge fisherman uh, sea captain's daughter. That is his last letter home. <coughs> My dear cousin, who's also named Alexandra, one of my favorite relatives, I asked her for help. I said, you know, I called up the black guy. I said, please help me. Well, she dug through my aunt's uh, mementos and found this letter written by Alexandros to his wife and children from Halifax, Nova Scotia, 9th of May, 1940, as he's getting on to a convoy. Okay, now notice the date. Was Greece at war then? Not officially, right? Right, there you go. It's a trick question. Not officially, but yes, the merchants were. And he's trying, he's basically lying throughout the, the letter saying, with these photos, you know, there's no problem. Everything's going to be fine. Remember that ship I showed you? That was his ship. 
When you click on the interactive map, you get the name of it, Halcyon. It was uh, under the Panamanian flag, the tonnage, the date, and notice it's not too far from uh, the US. Shelled by the U-boat 109. I got the latitude and longitude, fatalities three. So one of them was him. They surfaced and shelled ships. They targeted the older Greek ships and blew them out of the water. At the time, the US had just gotten into the war and we weren't really prepared for war at sea in the Atlantic. They would often surface and destroy ships, particularly American tankers. American tankers got absolutely mutilated going on the, uh, the trip from Venezuela up to the Atlantic seaboard, sometimes within sight of American cities. These were going down. All these ships, British, Dutch, Greek, American, and sailors were going down. As a matter of fact, there's a, a, a very important statistic. For US deaths in World War II, you were more likely to die as a merchant mariner than any branch of the military except the United States Marines. And remember, you've got Okinawa, you've got Tarawa, you've got Saipan, you know what our, our Marines had to deal with. Well, after that casualty rate, you had this one. So here's some more statistics, the, as I call it, the numbers gruesome tale. I've got uh, my latest article in Neo Magazine has the same uh, uh, title. So even though you would think Greece, being a Mediterranean country, the sinkings would be more there, 74% in the Atlantic. To keep that supply line going, Greek ships were going down and Greeks were losing their lives. And again, as I said, about a third of them, 40%, you know, maybe uh, around there, went down before Greece was, and Germany were officially at war. Right? And a lot of those losses and deaths were before the heroic Oki. So next time, hopefully, when you think of Oki Day, and honor is due, I mean, they. What, what, our, what our troops did there was absolutely amazing. But let's think about these guys, because without supplies, Rommel himself said, supplies are the basis of the battle, right? And part of the reason that Germany did not win that war is because of supplies. These are the top five U-boat losses. Again, you would expect Britain to be the highest. The United States second. Little Norway, third, and again the Norwegians, uh, this is where they're really shown in terms of their war effort. The Netherlands and Greece right behind. Now I think if we would add the uh, flags of convenience, the Greek number would top the, the, uh, the Netherlands number. But when you really look at those statistics, you hear something else. Think about Greece. By far the poorest country of any of those, except for, the, for Norway, the smallest country. And let's think about Greece's wartime experience back in the motherland. Who had a more brutal war than Greece? Yugoslavia. Yes, okay. I mean, you've got a couple, you've got contenders, but none of these are contenders. You can say Russia, yes, absolutely. Yugoslavia, Poland, but none of these countries had that kind of war. So these are more numbers. The ships, 1939, what was left in 1945, losses due to war, losses due to marine hazard. After 1943, the tide was turned particularly uh, uh, through use of uh, long distance planes. The anti-submarine <laughs> efforts of the United States and Britain effectively shut down the killing fields of the North Atlantic. So the losses in 1943 were far smaller than that horrible year of 1942. 
even more in 1944, and no Greek ships were lost in 1945. Over 2,000 Greeks lay dead at the bottom of the sea. And 85% of those losses were from the Germans. But in spite of it, we prevailed and the Allies prevailed. And then what happened? The Blessed Liberty ships. Because the United States, like all the other combatants, was bleeding to death from all the shipping losses, American ingenuity and can-do spirit, along with a British naval architect that first designed the Liberty ships, inaugurated the Liberty ship program. 2,700 Liberty ships were built often within a month's time. So in other words, January 1st, keel is laid, January 30th, a cheap bottle of champagne is uh, splashed against the hull and it goes out the slipway. What kind of slipway? Look at this. Look at that assembly line. So the same assembly line mentality that was going into making tanks and guns, we put to shipping. So suddenly we had more than enough ships. And again, as Lou pointed out, and my late father who served on the Liberty ship said, yes, they, there was a, they had some rough edges. They had the welding and the old time um, seamen always thought that you have to have riveted ships. But again, it reflects the, the mentality of the era. If the ship could do two crossings, it can, was considered to have paid for itself. But as Lou pointed out, many of these ships lasted much longer and a couple of them are still around. Well, after the war, in uh, a case of enlightened self-interest, a win-win, the ultimate win-win, the United States government offloaded Liberty ships at cut rate prices. Greeks were the biggest buyers. So once again, as before so many times, having lost everything, and with all of the ships at the bottom of the sea, Phoenix-like, the Greeks prevailed yet again. So who's this uh, good-looking fellow with um, holding a cap? He's my late uncle, Costas Pirinis. He served on a Liberty ship. He was, a, he was an engineer. My late father, John, was an apprentice captain before they both, like so many, jumped ship, right? I mean, let's, let's uh, as we say in Greek, right? He jumped ship, married a Greek-American girl, and became a very proud American. Whenever he spoke about the Liberty ships, his eyes went misty. <clears throat> The February 8th lecture is on this ship, the last Liberty. The other Liberty ship that's still in existence and is a museum as well, is in Baltimore. Baltimore and Piraeus are sister cities. One last statistic. Uh, again, Lou stole my thunder. It's not, but it's not like you don't know this. Greeks own the world's largest merchant fleet. Please share your stories. What flag is this? Anyone? Yes. Either. Itan i epitas. Yes. It's a Greek thing. It's a Greek thing I'm getting. So again, uh, being a proud high add that at the end. I thank you so much for your time. Obviously some of the early uh, earlier families were not from, uh, not all from Idra. Okay? There was uh, families from Andros, I have seen. There was many families from uh, Hios, for example, uh, the Pitas family will also be on the, uh, on the panel discussion um, on February 8th, we had the Raleigh uh, brothers again that we talked about from uh, Kios. 
And then we can go on into the 20th century, uh, families from uh, Santorini, uh, Lazis from the Peloponnesus, uh, Marinakis from Crete, uh, Hugues from Piraeus, Polemis from Andros, Niakos from Sparti, Onassis from Smyrna, Sutos from Samos. Uh, we can go um, Bernucos from Sifnus. Okay? We, we can go on and on. So thank you, thank you again. I have now the privilege of, uh, of uh, introducing uh, two people, actually. One that had a tremendous, tremendous uh, personal role in actually uh, getting the uh, SSO that became the Alas Liberty that uh, Alexander spoke about a second ago. And uh, it's just amazing the story of what he had to go through and, and how there was help from many different sources, including, including the ship owners themselves. And then uh, after that, we're going to have Jim Tampakis, who actually was part of the refurbishing of the ship and the prepping of the ship to bring it into, into the port of Piraeus. I have a real, uh, uh, it's an honor for me to uh, introduce Rhode Island State Senator Ramirez Raptakis. And he's going to discuss the Liberty Project, what he did, and all the things that took place after that, because uh, you were very involved. You know, the pivotal, you had the pivotal role. So it's my pleasure to introduce Senator Raptakis. Thank you, Mr. Green, my brother happens. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I think it's very important what is said this evening because history is very important. Uh, past history, our present history, and our future history. And uh, Professor, I want to commend you. You brought up a lot of good points. And I just want to say something that uh, you probably don't know this, but IDRA is even playing a, a greater role today. As you know, back in March of 2018, here in New York, the agreement was signed by the United States government, Sunny Maritime, with uh, the president of the university and the commander of the IDRA Maritime Academy, one of the oldest academies. And that's very important because it bonds again, so many years later, our history between the United States and Greece. And as we speak today, just a few months ago with uh, Commander Danelos, the Greek Parliament, as we speak, are taking up the final agreement to ratify that agreement between IDRA Maritime Academy and Sunny Maritime Academy in Port Schuyler, right down the street. And what it's doing is bonding Greek students with American cadets, naval students here that attend uh, the university. And uh, we, they chose either because, again, of the past history that you had shown here earlier, Professor. And uh, also, you brought up another good point about uh, those that survived the crossing of the Atlantic. My dad was a survivor. He was in the Greek Navy in 1937 to 1939. He was a blacksmith and a musician and got drafted by the uh, Navy. Once he finished serving the Greek Navy because of the conditions in Andros, that's where we're from, and throughout Greece, uh, the Katochi, prior, after the Depression, he embarked on the Neolas, which was a Greek passenger ship from the Greek line from Andros. And I remember him uh, telling me, and you can see some of the pictures of a Greek passenger liner, first one of the first Greek passenger liners that serviced from Piraeus to New York. They had a big, giant Greek flag painted on the side, so that ship, being a passenger ship, wouldn't be sunk by U-boats. So he embarked probably about the beginning of 1940, and around October 28, 1940, that ship was heading westbound toward New York, and they had just uh, crossed through Gibraltar when Orchid Day took place. The captain of that ship put that ship, the Nailas, full steam ahead. The ship arrived in New York Harbor. My father, along with the crew, disembarked, and he started his 
Korea, his U.S. citizenship, I should say, because he went from the Greek Maritime Merchant Marine to the U.S. Army and served the entire war proudly. But what happened to that ship, it was taken over by the British, and it survived. And it's still, after the war, it was a troop ship for the British. It survived and became, again, a passenger ship for the Greek line and brought thousands of Greeks here to New York, Port of New York. But basically, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what's important is uh, a lot of history is being told this evening. And the Alas Liberty, you heard, 2,700 were built. Only three survived. We have the John Brown down in Baltimore, Jeremiah O'Brien out in San Francisco. And I hate giving those names out because they stole a lot of the parts from the Arthur Huddle that was one of the last remaining Liberty ships which served our government proudly. The U.S. government was built in uh, uh, October 27th. The keel was laid in uh, 1943 in Jacksonville, Florida in the St. John River. And it took probably around 30 days. It was launched on December 7th, 1943, the second anniversary of Pearl Harbor. That ship served the U.S. Uh, maritime fleet during uh, Normandy as a fuel uh, ship and then later on a uh, supply ship and after that survived the war one of the ones that survived the war and uh, it served the uh, a company of ITT up to about 1984 that ship was laying a cable across the Atlantic for ITT and uh, it was retired in 1984 and it was sitting there in the James River in Virginia for all those years. As we uh, turn the history clock, around 2003, a lot of the Greek ship owners from various islands, uh, Polemis, Kostantakopoulos, uh, uh, many others, wanted to preserve the great maritime history of Greece from the past to the present and also the future. And during one of my uh, trips to Greece, it was my father's one-year memorial. He had passed away on going back and forth on vacation in 2002. I met Spiro Spolem. He said, where is there a liberty ship left? I said, uh, Spiro, we've got to find out where if there's any liberty ship left. Because there was very, there was hardly, no, there was only two. And there was one sitting in the Thames River in London, sunk. British never raised it up because it was loaded with uh, ammunition and explosives. They let it sit there. And the only one that was left was the Arthur Huddle in the James River. So what happened was, ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't just taking that ship out of the James River. First of all, the condition was horrible. That ship state was resting there for so many years. The, Arthur, the uh, John Brown and the Jeremiah Brown took so many of the parts, it was just rotting there. It was, when you see the pictures from uh, Jimmy Tampax's presentation, there was probably nothing left, no portholes, nothing. The, a lot of the birds made uh, their residence there for about 30 years, and the bird iguana must have been at least about a foot deep. So along came uh, uh, the Minister Kefalogiannis, Ambassador Rees, our U.S. Ambassador to the Hellenic Republic, and also other interests, and working together, of putting a plan together, we had to go through the U.S. Administration, Maritime Administration in 2004, 2005, meeting in Washington, D.C., several meetings to find out well, how we can transfer that ship. At the time, the ship was being um, held in reserve by uh, a corporation, Bochamp Corporation down in Florida to use it for some purposes. They did nothing with it. So a preliminary agreement by the Maritime Administration was signed with Spiro Polemis. You just can't take the ship out of the James River, ladies and gentlemen, because the ship under federal law could not be no donated to any country because of the EPA. PCBs, there's a federal law that no ship can be transferred to either, either a foreign nation because it has to be cleaned up. And we thought at that time, it's gonna cost us millions. Well, the uh, initial money, about $100,000, was given by Spiro Polemis, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency uh, gave permission for the ship to be examined, and Marat examined that ship. And it was great to see that there was very little contaminants on the ship, about $80,000 to clean that ship, to remove any PCBs or 
asbestos hazards that were on that ship. It was a very clean ship. So in order to do the transfer, you have to have an act of Congress. My U.S. Uh, Senator John Chafee, uh, Lincoln Chafee from Rhode Island, along with other members of Congress, the Greek-American delegation, Paul Sarbanes, Gus Bilirakis, Paul Sarbanes, and John, father and son, they had to write up a piece of legislation. It was attached to the John Warner Defense Act, and in 2006, it was finally approved by the U.S. Congress. And I'm gonna tell you a quick story. Even our good friends from across the Aegean, Turkey, had to be somehow notified to make sure that this what didn't uh, upset some kind of trade agreement or what the ship was being used for, etc. We had to pass that out of that uh, out of. But evidently, uh, the agreements were uh, were signed technically on uh, June 2008 in Athens with ABS giving a $250,000 donation. The U.S. Maritime Administrator flew to Greece along with the uh, Ambassador, then was Ambassador Speckhardt. Uh, Bulgarakis was the minister, and the initial agreement was signed. Finally, it could be transferred. Well, the ship was laying in the James River, and in July 2008, it was towed out of the James River to Norfolk, and it sat there for about six months. And Jim, again, is going to go into details of what it took to prepare that ship for the Atlantic tow. December 6th, St. Nicholas Day, again being a, a very proud day for seafarers, the ship was towed by a Polish tug, took about 39 days, and we were very skeptical because of the condition of the ship, would it make it? And uh, we were very lucky. It only met maybe some uh, rough weather off the coast of Malta. Finally arrived in uh, Greece on uh, January 11th, towed into Piraeus Harbor, and from there, uh, Mr. Kostantakopoulos was so infatuated with the ship coming into Piraeus Harbor, he served on Libya ships, he donated right then and there $10 million to create what you know right now as one of the best museums that uh, Greece, the other country other than the two liberties we mentioned earlier, here in the United States, and when you look at some of the pictures, and when you board that vessel, those who have not visited the Last Liberty, it's a museum to go see. The ship was refurbished better than the condition minus the engines, because it's not a uh, active uh, ship, better than the John Brown and the Jeremiah Bryant. And I, I'm proud today to say to those museums, you stole all the parts, but the Greek ship owner, especially Mr. Kostantagopoulos, made it even better. So they're jealous of the museum that sits in Piraeus Harbor right now. But again, uh, those are the serious points, uh, very important points that I want to bring up to everyone here, that it was a very, very uh, a proud project. And I just want to, lastly, in closing, I spoke the other day to Kronis Rivers, who is a US citizen. He married a young lady from Rhode Island. He worked in uh, the hotel industry here in the United States and became the postal president of Greece. The, U, the, like the Greek Postal Service, <laughs> we have the US Postal Service here. He is the uh, president of the Greek Postal Service. So I was on the phone with him the other day and said, it's a 10 year anniversary. How about if this year, Greece creates a postage stamp of the Alas Liberty U.S. and American flag and commemorating the 10th anniversary of the last liberty. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Senator Attack has mentioned uh, some some important things, and part of the part of the reason why the monument I'd like the monument wow. to be alone in Manhattan certainly has to do with the with the fact that as we we talked that there was a large Hellenic community west of Broadway at that particular time. On Broadway, there was a lot of uh, Hellenic shipping companies. But also, St. Nicholas, the only church that was destroyed on 9-11, uh, was named after St. Nicholas because he was the patron saint of the, uh, of the Mariners. And as a matter of fact, people on the board and from the history of that church, from the very beginning, were in fact from the shipping industry. 
So the date, the date of, uh, of the 6th becomes important. The date of the 7th that you mentioned, December 7th of 1943, two years after Pearl Harbor, and I, and I heard that day, that day for the first time tonight. And on that day, two years before, on, this, on December 7th, uh, an uncle of mine was killed in uh, Pearl Harbor, and he's buried in the uh, U.S. Uh, Arizona, um, which is a, a national monument. So all these dates start to, start to work together. It's, it's kind of amazing that here we are, a fairly new organization, and uh, we're part of the 10th anniversary of the, of the, of the Liberty uh, Alas, I, I, I think it's all meant to happen, by the way. The next person in terms of meant to happen, okay, is James Tampakis. Now James, I've known, I've known Jimmy, Jimmy for a long time. I didn't realize when talking to the two gentlemen that in fact, uh, uh, Senator Laptakis and, uh, and Jim Tampakis were, were actually students together in, in, uh, in Greece, actually. With that, uh, I introduce a good friend, Jim Tampakis, the owner of Marine Spares International, on the refurbishing and prepping of the SS Arthur Huddle. I have my notebook from uh, 2008. <clears throat> I still use composition notebooks. I'm up to 100 and something. <laughs> Uh, my name is Jim Tampakis. I have been brought up uh, in the ship repair industry. My dad <coughs> started, uh, had a machine shop. Uh, he went to, uh, he, he was a graduate from a technical school in Piraeus. And when he came here in uh, 1950, by 1954, he started his own business. Uh, doing shipping and ship repair work and uh, had a machine shop, etc. So I, I, I received the call between Lou and uh, Mr. Bolemis, who uh, I, my wife's cousin, and they asked me if I can assist because they had some difficulties in receiving the vessel. The vessel was laid up for 30 years, as Mr. Attack has said, and if they hadn't done with, if we couldn't get it done by the summer of 2008, they were just gonna send the ship down to Brownsville to scrap it. So, and that would have been the last Liberty ship. Uh, so, Mr. Riptakis and uh, myself and a group of other people from Polemis' office went and started exploring the possibilities of doing this project. So this is the ship currently in Piraeus. And this was one of the engineers from uh, Mr. Polemis' office, Mr. Ferenduros, who was an Andriotti. And uh, there's the, I have it because there's a lot of pictures and I'm just going through them quickly, so we're not here all night. Uh, so the first thing we did was we went on to the John W. Brown so that we can understand the condition of the Brown. We went on board, we did ultrasonic thickness readings, we went, wanted to make sure that our hull wasn't paper thin because with all the electrolysis, the ships get a lot of wear and tear and they get thinner. So as you see Lou in a lot of these pictures because he was very active and on top of me all the time. So this again is the brown, this is the medical room, this is, what they did was in the tween deck, they made it into a museum like we have now on the Alas Liberty, so those were females that were working uh, in the shipyards because the men were out at sea and at war. Uh, and they had machine shops on there. One of my things always was the Liberty ships were also built in the aft cabin. So now this is, now we're looking at this vessel that was destined for a scrap yard. Now Lou says that they stole the parts and they stole everything. Really, it was in such decrepit condition. It, I mean, they had no idea that anybody would ever attempt to save this ship. So when I went down to, uh, when I went down to Virginia the first time, and I found a British surveyor that helped uh, some people that I knew down in Brownsville, Texas. So this is the fleet, and this is the way that all the ships were. They had them like mothballed, and there were hundreds of ships down there. 
and we were just one little ship. And this is uh, Mystery Bonum also from Seacrest. So I went down there and I said to uh, the surveyor, William Ty, I said, Bill, I, you know, I'm, I want to take this ship and bring it to Greece and make it into a museum. And he looked at me and he said, you're up effing crazy. He says, it can't be done. And then he stopped and he said, well, he says, you know, if anybody could do it, it would be the Greeks. You know, so, and he, he, he made me feel better. So we received a vessel that was in horrible condition, but like I said, the first thing we wanted to do was make sure that the hull was worthy of the trip and of the life that we wanted to give it. So what I went and did, the first thing I did was I hired divers. And we sent divers down. I went to American Bureau of Shipping. We put bands around from the one side of the deck of the ship all the way to the other side of the ship, underneath the hull. So we had where the most critical weak spots of the ship were, so we could do ultrasonic thickness readings, and they were being transmitted to a computer on this boat, and this way we knew exactly what we were doing. Now, this was another ship that I eyed on, because this was a scan, this was a, a, a later vintage vessel, but it had the same cargo booms, and uh, the cargo booms, there were 12 cargo booms on the ship, they were 55 feet long, and we didn't have any. So I figured, okay, if this ship is gonna be broken, I wanna go and find out where it's gonna be broken up, pull off the cargo booms, and put them on the Adele. So then afterwards, we started doing work. We started blasting, cleaning. That winch loop, by the way, was donated to us from the John W. Brown. They had an extra winch, so they gave us something. So don't think that we had any of that. So we had to do, we had to prep the ship. So we had no portholes like you saw before, because every time somebody went on the vessel, they took a souvenir. They didn't only go there to take parts, but they would take a porthole that was nice, that was brass. They would take a clock. They would take a steering wheel. They would take whatever was on board the ship. So uh, now we had to reaccumulate everything. <laughs> Uh, one of my requirements with the, uh, with the government was to make the ship seaworthy. So we didn't want to be able to hit any kind of rough sea and have the ship sink. So I had to close all the portholes, all 60 of them. Uh, so we cut three quarter inch Lexan. I did the bolt circle pattern, got gaskets, butt nuts, bolts, put it all together. Then we cleaned everything. I went to the John W. Brown, I spoke to uh, the captain on the ship. Uh, we needed to find out, uh, I, I wanted to know where we can get all the tarpaulins because the hatch covers needed to be protected. As you saw in earlier pictures, the hatch boards were horrible. Uh, where back in the day, they used to have airplanes and tanks on these hatch boards. That's how strong these hatch boards were. It was two and a quarter inch thick, each, each board. So, because one of the things that the government wanted me to do was to make sure that we could deploy the anchor. Uh, and I'm like, fine. I said, but then how am I gonna get it back up? They said, I don't care if you can get it back up. I just want you to be able to deploy it. They were thinking that if we're off the coast of, of, the coast of Portugal, and you know, they, we go into rough seas because we were getting towed, they were afraid that, you know, that the ship is just gonna run right onto the beach. So they wanted to have us be able to drop the anchor. So I said, I want to be able to pick up the anchor. So because the boilers weren't working, we went and got, I went and bought a compressor, an 825 CFM compressor, diesel driven, and we fixed all the steam lines and we put compressed air in them. So we were working the winches with compressed air as opposed to the boiler. We also put on a generator so that we can have lights to work uh, the, the pumps and, uh, and, and lighting that we required. So this fellow there, so this, this, this stuff over here was from various uh, different depots that the reserve fleet had throughout the country. And I was flying around trying to pick out things that we needed. We had two Liberty ships propellers 
it weren't used this by the, uh, by the, in the museum, but they didn't want to let them go. So we didn't have a propeller for the ship. We didn't have a rudder either, because they went on the ground, as Lou mentioned. So what I wanted to do was, the, uh, on the Victory ships, the propeller again was 18 foot diameter, and I had an opportunity to take a Liberty ship propeller, a uh, Victory ship propeller. The pitch was different, and since it wasn't working, it didn't really make a difference because the Liberty ship was two and a half thousand horsepower and the Victory ship was seven and a half thousand horsepower. More horsepower at a different pitch, but it didn't make a difference to us because it wasn't gonna spin anyway. So we got a, 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 a board in a barge and put this monstrosity, 18 foot diameter propeller, put it in the number one cargo hold, and we welded it in place. So then all these openings needed to be secured, all the doors had to be watertight, uh, the vent valves, those inverted vent valves that you see, those upside down things, the U's, were, uh, had to be able to have the tanks breathe and, and not be able to take on the water. There's a ball in there. So if the water level got up, the valve would go up and, and close so this way it wouldn't flood the uh, inside of the ship. So these were pictures going down Brownsville, Texas, picking up parts, picking up all the different uh, uh, cargo blocks and pilot ladders. This was the airlines that we had for the compressors. That was the compressor, so that this way we can operate the winches. This is basically the way we prepped everything on board the ship before we sail. We proudly uh, hung the American flag, and we also had the Greek flag in the back of the ship, because at this point, it was a Greek vessel and we renamed it the Halas Liberty. So, and we had accommodation ladders, et cetera, et cetera. So we waited for two months. We were basically, we were done by October with the vessel to leave, but then we were trying to find a cheap tow. <coughs> cheap tow meaning three quarters of a million dollars. Everything else was coming at 1.2, 1.3 million. So, we wanted to find a, a cheaper tow. There was a ship that was being towed to Gibraltar, and we waited, and it, it, when it unloaded in Gibraltar, it wound up coming over just across the Atlantic, which it was not that bad. And then we hooked up, and we started prepping for the voyage. These are the people, again, that were involved with the project. The fellow from the Greek Coast Guard wasn't involved in the project. He came down for the photo op. <laughs> so, and this is us towing the vessel away and uh, getting ready for the crossing. Then we basically, this is downtown Norfolk, Virginia. So, all the bridges had to go up to watch the Hellas Liberty go through. And, uh, and that was the, uh, the Poseidon was the name of the Polish tub. So, it took us 34 days to do the crossing. When I spoke to the captain, I said, Captain, how long do you think wow, it's going to take? Years. He told me, I'm estimating 35 days. And he did it in 34 days. And for those 34 days, we were monitoring because throughout the Atlantic, on each, they have buoys, sea buoys, and they can tell you waves, wind speed, uh, just basically all of this data. So we knew, you know, and the captain also knew on board the tug what he was going to be facing within the next day. If, if there were rough seas, it was smooth sailing the whole way. Wow. The captain told me that the only problem that they had wasn't outside of Italy, it was outside of Pilos, where they had this bad storm that came in, and he just stopped, went over to the side, waited. So now the ship went to Piraeus, they put it in the dry dock, they sandblasted it, painted it, coated it. The ship looks beautiful. I mean, two years ago or three years ago, I had the U.S. Maritime Administrator on board the ship. He was like, I can't believe this is a Liberty ship. He said, you know, how, how, could we get it back to the United States? He's like, yeah, I can post you can get it back. That was it. No, there he is. So, I mean, everything on in the ship, uh, the, the, the gentleman that was the one that funded the project, took the vessel, put it in dry dock, and did a first class job on the vessel. I mean, 
they just did, you'll, you'll see in another minute, inside, I mean, this is all the sandblasting, coatings, uh, the vessel is just, if you ever go to Greece, I'm sure everybody goes to Greece, it's in the Port of Piraeus, it's off Atimiali, it's right where the ships go to Crete. You should definitely go on board and just take a look at it. I mean, we do events on the ship all the time. So now this is inside where all that pigeon and stuff was. And now, I mean, you'll see it's like the cabins are like today's luxury yachts. The way they have, you know, with the wood and the beds and the bunks. One thing I wanted to say that I didn't say because I'm trying to catch up with the pictures here because I have a lot of pictures and they're just looking through, that the U.S. Navy uh, always had 50 Navy uh, uh, naval soldiers on board the Liberty ships. So they would have the crew in the front accommodation and in the back they would have the Navy. And I'm like, how did they fit 50 Navy guys in the back of the ship? And it was real easy. It was a room that was not big at all and they just had these hanging bunk beds, five on each one like you saw earlier, and they were just, you know, ten rows of five, and they, they had all these guys in a, an area of nothing, like one bedroom, and they had all of these guys. So, uh, further on, I had, we were short some telephones and radios and a very gentle bronze, I mean exotic metals, just, a beautiful piece of equipment. And instead of putting it down in the engine room, they put it in the museum part of the ship. So this way people can appreciate it. So, uh, and this, this is basically the way the ship is today. These are the boilers. Now, before we saw pictures of the engine room and the condition that it was in, you know, the, the Liberty ship had a three cylinder steam reciprocating engine. So the low pressure piston, it was 24, 36, and 70 and a half inches in diameter. So the diameter of the one piston, the last, you know, piston on, on the three-cylinder engine was as big as, as my, my height was the diameter of the piston, just so you have an idea. And every single thing on the ship was up and down. Dot, 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 dot. It had three generators that were 20 kW generators. We probably use 10, 15 kW in our houses, and they ran the whole ship with three 20 kW generators. Now the ships have 1,500 kW, you know, three 500 kW. Forget about the Queen Mary and stuff like that. They use 14,000 kW. That's how many, you know, between their air conditioning and refrigeration. So now these are just pictures. This is in the, in the museum part of the vessel. Uh, that's my uh, circulating pump. Uh, they painted everything. That's a reciprocating pump. So the other nice thing was that all the Greek ship owners, whatever we were missing, all the Greek ship owners that had Liberty ships, they would say, ah, So everybody chipped in, and whatever additional items we needed, they went and bought them from their house, or wherever they have them stored, their summer house, and they brought them and we made the ship complete. That little cannon that you saw there, whoever saw it, was a, uh, was a line throwing apparatus that I got out of, uh, out of Virginia when I went down with Mr. Polemis and I said, Mr. Polemis, I said, what other things do you think we need here? And he says, he says, I said, everything is, everything is gonna be a donation. Everything's gonna be a donation. Let's take this, let's take this, let's take this. So we filled a 40-foot container of stuff from, from, uh, from, which were all like, you know, every room had a nice brass clock, every, I mean, just all of this different line throwing apparatuses, et cetera, et cetera. So this is still continuing, this is the engine room. Uh, I want you to take a look and see. So in, this was the refrigeration, that they had these again in the uh, in the tween deck. They had these are all the Liberty ships the way you guys saw the pictures earlier. Uh, we have the history of uh, the Liberty ships. This is about the, the Greeks losing the 2,000 seamen. Uh, it, it, 
there's, it's, it's a wonderful venue to go to, to, you know, I, I wish the Greeks would use it more than what they do. Uh, they do bring it for school trips and stuff like that. They do have parties and stuff. So this is, you know, they, they did everything. They regalvanized the water fountain, just so you can understand the leptomania that they wound up doing in the place. Cemented all the floors because from the bird guano, everything was totally corroded. This is uh, the chart room. These were the bedrooms. All the doors were made brand new. Uh, again, I, we broke the glass on the clock here on that one. But, so this is the, uh, this is the, uh, you know, the up where the, yeah, the bridge of the vessel. And these are all the different components. That was the original one that was on the hotel. Everything else was changed. This is my daughter, Sophia. Uh, this was the repeaters. All these telephones that we got, I guess I got donated again. Ayos Nicolas in between my wife and my daughter. Uh, we got all these towel vents. The towel vents were bringing in air into the different compartments of the engine room and the cargo holds. And depending on which way the wind was spinning, you could turn them so this way they would get more air. And if you didn't want it, you'd turn them again. So they took off all of the plexi, uh, the, the, the plexiglass portholes that we made, casted brand new ones in foundries and made them again from the beginning. 60 kW generator for the lighting. Again, so this is where we are right downtown. That's the bar dog that watches the ship, security. It's a restoration of love. Yes, I mean, look at, but this is, this was the, uh, the captain's room and also the officer's room. So you look at the pictures here now, and look at the first pictures that you saw, where you're like, what can you possibly do with this? And that's why the Brit told me, he says, you're, you're crazy. I mean, what are you gonna do? So, and uh, that's about it. So, thank you very much. And a lot of people on delivery ships, one last thing I wanted to mention that I forgot to was that we had so many leftover liberty ships after World War II, even after a thousand of them went into the merchant fleets. We even had ships here by the Tappanzee Bridge. There were like 20, 30 liberty ships. And the other thing they were doing with them, and they, then they broke them in the 70s down in uh, Kearney, New Jersey, where they had some breaking yards. And back in the day, uh, they used to take these liberty ships 10 at a time and sink them and make artificial reefs. So that's why, I mean, there were just so many of them. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so as, as I indicated, uh, on February 8th, uh, MCA is going to have an event, uh, the 10th year anniversary of uh, the Liberty Ship leaving Virginia, going to the uh, Port of PDA. And we're going to have a fantastic panel there. I will moderate the panel, as I indicated. And what's important tonight is not only the 10th anniversary of the Alas Liberty, but also what the past, present, and future is on Greek shipping. And also to encourage Greek students and American students, both at Sunny Maritime and either uh, Merchant Marine Academy, students that are looking to pursue their careers in the Greek Merchant uh, Maritime Industry, and we're not saying to go as ship captains or cooks or electricians, but as accountants, lawyers, uh, finance uh, advisors, to work in Piraeus, to work in London, to work in New York, where, where Greek shipping is throughout this world. And I think it's, it's great to bond the history of the past, current, and future. Very important, and all these pieces are one big puzzle of maritime history of both Greece and the United States. MGTV USA. Οι δραστηριότητε τη ελληνοαμερικανική κοινότητα με βίντεο και πλήρε ρεπορτάζ. Επισκεφτείτε την ιστοσελίδα μα mgtvusa.com. Καλύπτουμε καθημερινά τα γεγονότα στην Ομογένεια.